So talking with Jeff and uh, Gareth, we the subject of, hey, what do you, are, is there a process? I think this is kind of interesting. I mean, Peter Drucker, you know, would always say this, if, if anything good happened, uh, hey, do some research, do a deep dive. There's a process to that. Like success is never a fluke. Get the process. And of course, that's music to my ears. I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's a, uh, that's great. Yeah. If, if there is success being achieved, take a good look at it and, and analyze and come up with the steps. Like what are the steps to repeating that success? And so the question of, Hey, do you ever lose your confidence? I mean, come on, man. We, I mean, how many times the question is how many times a year are you losing your confidence? Some people, how many times a month are you losing your confidence? But I think that's a fair question. I think we all go through this. And so I put some thought into it. I came up with uh, really five things. If I had to come up with a process, I'm like, oh yeah, it's actually five little steps when I really think this through and I'll give it to you guys. But first I wanna start off with a, with a story that's gonna kind of lead to number one, the, my first point. Um, I remember, you know, it's funny, I, I got promoted to org consultant in 2003, seems like a long time ago. T 2003 was one of my, It'll go down in my my memory is like one of my best years. I got married in 2003. I actually between my promotion to OC and marriage was one week apart. Kind of interesting how that happened. That was a it was a grand, stressful but joyful week for me. Um, I got promoted to OC. I was on my game, number one on the Quill rankings. Nobody beat me. I, this might sound crazy to you, Grant, but I think my best week was a little under 400 accounts. I think that's what it was, you know? Um, so, and promoting our deals, top 10 owners were owners on my team. So I like, I, I felt like I could do no wrong. My, my feet weren't touching the ground. Con confidence and mojo were there. And then I, and don't ask me how, but I got into a slump like immediately after the promotion. Maybe I just got a little too cocky. Maybe I got too big for my britches. And I went through a slump for around six months. It was a six month slump where I hovered between five and eight reps. And keep in mind, this is gonna sound crazy to you. I was having over a hundred prelim preliminary interviews coming in per week. Helen was my recruiter, over a hundred shows. And after six months of a hundred shows, I mean, I don't even want to calculate the math. That'll just nag me out. Um, I only had five to eight reps. I never had more than eight and thank goodness never went below five. And I remember Helen, I mean, I could tell she's getting frustrated. I mean, I'm getting frustrated. I don't know what's wrong. I'm supposed to have all the answers. You know, I just got promoted. I'm supposed to be, you know, smart or good at what I do or something like that. I remember eventually after six months, Helen's like, hey, Jamie, just can I have a, can I have a one on one with you? Can we talk this through? Hey, what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, Helen, you're not doing anything wrong. I mean, I, I was so pleased with her. I'm like, you're bringing me 100 shots on goal. The fact I can't score, that, that's on me. But for you, Helen, you're not doing anything wrong. I finally, after like trying to exhaust all my things, I go to Joanne, my, my new wife. We had just moved in together. I, I, we didn't move in until we got married and stuff like that. And so I'm like, hey, I'm just curious. Do you notice anything different with me? I'm trying to figure it out. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of sucking at work. And she says, well, you're just not as like happy. You're not as, you know, you're just not as joyful when you come home. You look a little exhausted. And, you know, I, and I really took the time to stop on that one. And it's really point number one. And it, it's, it just sounds so cliche. It just sounds so like, duh. But it starts with your attitude. Now, I'll kind of give the some subcategories under the world of attitude. But number one is there's this disease we should all be very uh, aware of. And there's no vaccine for this disease. It requires a lot of self-awareness to, to actually remedy this problem. It's called jobitis. And jobitis, I mean, here's a Zig Ziglar quote. 
is what he calls a wandering generality. He says, people that go to work today, because that's what they did yesterday, and they're nowhere closer to the goal that they never even set in the first place. I was totally guilty of jobitis. I'd wake up early in the morning, get to the office, do my one-on-ones, run my morning meeting, do all my interviews, meet up with the guys for evening atmosphere, do my one-on-ones, rinse, repeat again the next day. And little did I realize I was going into work with a major loss of enthusiasm. I mean, that's, so, so I decided when, when Joanne pointed that out, I'm like, maybe it is that simple. I, that's kind of what I said. I'm like, maybe it's that simple. She's saying, you know, she's not coming home with that same like joyful spirit, you know. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do anything different. I'm just going to walk in singing zippity doo dah. I'm going to walk in. I'm just going to enjoy what I do. I'm going to enjoy my interviews. Enjoy the 110s. Enjoy the exit interviews. All the stuff that, you know, is kind of taxing. I just made a decision. I'm going to enjoy that and have fun with it. And I'm like, oh, didn't I go through this in the field to become an owner? I'm like, yeah, I was kind of going through the motions and that's why I wasn't building a crew. And then I had to kind of shake my head a little bit and start loving the field. And that's how I got out of it. I'm like, son of a gun. I had to learn the exact same lesson twice. I wonder how many times as owners, we have to learn that same lesson. But number one, in the world of like a process of how to get your confidence and get your mojo back. I mean, it really starts with attitude and just having fun, enjoying your work, enjoying that mundane, you know, groundhog's day scenario. You got to find the fun in that. Otherwise your guys will see it in you. And if you're not having fun, they're not having fun. All right. Second bullet point, it's, listen, an abundance of recruiting. Key word is abundance. Now, every day that I'm doing interviews, this is going to sound like I'm contradicting myself because I'm saying I need an abundance of interviews to just get one guy per day. Okay, so you're talking about abundance. Now you're talking about one. Yeah, I just need one. I mean, you think about it, one game changer. I, I just got off a call with Sebastian. I was just, we we're talking about Michael Sessions and I was telling him how, how good Michael Sessions is doing right now. And he's like, oh, who, who are the guys on Sessions team? I'm like, well, he's got, he's got uh, Bruinger and he's got Ken Lear, just to name two. He's like, oh, he's set. I just named two game changers and Sebastian's first response is, oh yeah, he's set. It's true. I mean, so you don't need 20 Michael Jordans to win a, a championship or, you know, let's in the spirit of the Lakers win yesterday, you only need one LeBron and maybe one Anthony Davis and a couple other, you know, key players, but you don't need 20 LeBron Jameses. So I'm just looking for one person per day that excites me. I was thinking about this the other day too, with team nights, like, if I've got a crew that excites me, I want to be a team knight. If I got a crew that kind of nags me out, I don't want to be a team knight. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. If team night is a chore and it's work, you got the wrong crew. If team night is a thrill and it's a joy, you got the right team. So I need an abundance. I need just I need the volume play so I can get one a day. One a day is just five a week. If I've got five good shots on goal per week and I can land three of those guys, I'm rocking and rolling. One game changer changes the entire business. It gets the confidence back, obviously. All right, number three, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but if you haven't, you know, grab this and use it in your morning meetings or whatever it may be. I mean, a thermostat leader versus a thermometer leader. I remember when I first heard this. A thermometer has no talent. It just tells you what the existing temperature already is. That's what a thermometer does. It just, it just tells you the existing temperature. A thermostat has huge value because it changes the temperature. And if you're observing that your crew is too cold, you gotta be the thermostat and turn it hot so your crew gets hot. 
But really, thermostat leadership is all about your guys are really just a reflection of you. And so if you want to change the environment, it really starts with you being that thermostat. And maybe I could go back to point number one about attitude, but, but there's more in thermostat. There's your work ethic. There's your student mentality. There's your can I principle, constant never ending improvement. You guys will hear from Aladdin on the next call. I'm like, I'm telling you in the last three months, I don't even recognize this kid. He did something in the world of can I, constant, never-ending improvement. And you'll hear it. You'll hear the, his little interview that we're going to do. Um, but that's the thermostat. And then it's spilled into his guys. His guys took that same thing. So just understand, you're, you're a thermostat. I mean, the rate of the pack is determined by the pace of the leader. You want the crew to run faster, the pace of the leader has got to run fast. Okay, so then here's bullet point number four. I might be ripping into a lot of this stuff. I like this one. Experiment. Experiment. I mean, if we were professional coaches, let's say, in sports, your first gig is going to be some, you know, you're not going to start off as an NBA coach. You're going to start off like maybe high school basketball, maybe small college or something like that. And that's where you experiment. I mean, Phil Jackson's stomping ground for experimentation. If any of you have read Sacred Hoops, obviously I'm a huge Phil Jackson fan. It's like, oh, you know, what happened from when Phil was a Knickerbocker, you know, playing with the New York Knicks, and then he coached the Chicago Bulls. You know, what, what was in between that? Yeah, he was a head coach in the Puerto Rican Basketball League for five years. That's where he experimented his brains out. So when I say experiment, it's like, okay, you know what? The production was awful yesterday. I'm going to do something. I'm going to change the, and I'm going to do something totally wild for tomorrow's morning meeting. You know what? The guys are expecting me to beat them up because we did so poorly. You know what? I'm going to go in and just act like I just won the lottery. I just want to see what happens when I do that. You know what? I'm going to change the music up and see what happens. Like just keep experimenting to find your secret sauce. Don't keep doing the same playbook. I mean, Einstein says, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So change some things up. Instead of going to an office for a morning meeting, meet your guys at McDonald's for a morning meeting, change it up. Like just do things a little bit different, experiment. You know what, this guy, you know, I've been so soft on this guy. I'm going to just see what happens. I'm going to like, I'm going to kick this guy in the butt. I want to see what happens. And you take little notes, note to self. Don't, when a guy's fighting with the girlfriend, don't beat him up. Note to self. Okay. That didn't work. But you got to take notes because what's going to happen is you're going to figure this thing out and you're going to get your confidence when you see the result. I mean, am I, I mean, that's, that's my go-to calling card with the coaching Little League Baseball. It's the relationship between confidence and competence. I don't try to boost the kid's confidence. I mean, what am I, a motivational speaker? I'm little Tony Robbins to a bunch of 11-year-old boys? No, I'm focusing totally on the competence. Get the result and the confidence will come. So I think with experimenting, you'll see little blips on the radar of like some competence and do that again, do it again, do it again. But experiment. And then my last thing, number five, and it could probably go back to point number one about attitude. But when I teach situational leadership, okay, I mean, this isn't in the book. This isn't, uh, you know, if Ken Blanchard heard this, he might say, hep, wrong. But just in my logical train of thought, Make sure we all know this language. You guys understand D1, D2, D3, D4. Just give me some nods if you know what I'm talking about here. Okay. So the goal is to go from D1 to D4. And you got to make a pit stop in D2. You got to make a pit stop D3 to become D4. Everybody with me thus far? Okay. What's the difference between now and D2? And so far, everything I'm teaching is straight from Ken Blanchard. D2 is, they say, this is where turnover lies. 
Turnovers in D2, lack of commitment and a lack of competency. Oh yeah, that sounds like D2 for sure. So I tell people, hey, what's the difference between D1 and D2? You guys tell me, what is the difference? Uh, high, high direction. Well, they both require high direction as far as coaching goes. I'm just saying, diagno diagnostically confidence. speaking, what's the difference Conf between the two? Confidence. Confidence. Yeah, confidence, commitment, motivation. And it's a commitment thing. They both D1 and D2, the commonalities is they both suck. Their competence is low in D1 and D2. The difference is D1 has high motivation, high energy, high commitment, and D2 has lost the commitment. They've lost the energy. They've lost the motivation. So I've always said, if and when you're D2 at anything, well, I'd love to say, well, Jamie, just become D4. Okay, I, I, wish, I wish there was a pill for that. Okay, sure, I'll just be D4. Thanks, I needed that. Okay, I can't be D4 because I don't have the competence yet, but I can choose to be D1. I can go backward in this little arena. I might not be able to go forward. I'm stuck in a slump, but I can choose to go backward to D1. I know what it's like to be D1. I know what it's like to, hey, I suck, but I'm totally excited. I've never ridden a bike before, but I got a new bike. Oh, Jamie, you're going to fall a bunch of times. That's okay. I got a new bike. I can get my enthusiasm. I get my mojo that way. And the goal is to leapfrog over D2. I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with reps. I'm like, your goal is to leapfrog D2. Like, here's a Winston Churchill quote. When going through hell, don't stop to take a look around. I love that quote. You're going through hell, don't stop to take a look around. Don't take any pictures. Oh, well, let me get a selfie. I'm in hell right here. Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm in hell. You don't need to take any pictures. You don't need to look around. Put your blinders on and just get through hell. I don't need to stay there any longer than necessary. So when I'm in a slump and I'm lacking confidence, all right, man, I am D1 and I am leapfrogging. I want to avoid that horrible d2 at all cost and get to d3 as quick as possible so those are kind of my five little go-to's little jamieisms if you will on how to get your mojo back how to get your confidence um so that's what i got for you guys